Good afternoon, and thanks to all of you who have braved the weather to uh, come hear our speaker today um, at this event on gender violence with Tanya Ghani. Um, as I was just saying to Tanya, uh, one of the uh, flaws in our uh, programming is that we give so many students access to our visitors at so many different times during the day that by the time comes around for the public event, they've all seen her or him once, twice, three times. So this is what we get, but it's worth uh, coming out for, and I appreciate your doing so. So uh, by way of introduction, Tanya is a member of the class of 03, and she came to Hanover from Karachi, Pakistan, a city with a population of almost 15 million. So if there is a prize for having the greatest culture shock of any freshman measured in um, sort of disparate uh, environments and population density, she is probably a good candidate for it. Uh, I did some uh, back of the envelope calculations before. 15 million is roughly the population of all of New England. So um, tells you something. Uh, it's, a well, it's a pleasure to welcome Tanya back to campus for any number of reasons, but high among them certainly is her work in the field of countering gender-based violence. She currently serves as grants and program manager for the United Nations Trust Fund to End Violence Against Women, uh, which is housed in, uh, in UN Women in New York. Uh, there are, as we all know, far too many varieties of gender-based violence, from kidnap brides to female genital mutilations to honor killings to gang violence and so on and so on. In her role at the UN, Tanya has become an expert on many of them and uh, the enormous dimensions of the problem. Um, though, as she will point out, the UN doesn't work in the wealthy countries of the West. So there are some dimensions of this that are, are not in her ambit. Uh, she is responsible for leading and executing the UN Trust Fund's grant-making strategy and managing uh, its uh, grants management, which amounts to, am I correct, about 45 million a year? That's uh, a lot of uh, grants. Uh, this is work of extraordinary importance, and I know from talking to students here at the college that it's of interest to many in our community. And um, as we think about what kind of work we want to go into in life, it's also important, I believe, to hear from people who are not just at the end of their career. So it's particularly good to hear from someone like Tanya. Tanya joined the UN in 2008, and she has worked there over the last 11 years in varying capacities at the UN Trust Fund. Uh, before joining UN Women, she worked in Pakistan for an NGO focusing on sexual and reproductive health and rights, and she there co-authored the first ever research study on the role of Karachi's medical legal sector in responding to violence against women and girls. Tanya, uh, in addition to having a psychology degree from Dartmouth, has um, a master's in public policy from uh, the Kennedy School at Harvard, where she uh, concentrated on political and economic development um, when she is not uh, working to counter uh, gender violence, she is raising two young girls in New York City. So uh, with that, let me welcome Tanya to the Dickey Center. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, it really is such a pleasure for me to be here. This is the first time I've come back to Hanover um, since I graduated in 2003, and I wonder why it took me so long. You know, It's just a five hour bus ride away from New York, and it's just nice to, to be back. I'm so sorry to miss homecoming next weekend, but I'm sure it's going to be a very, very busy time here. Um, so the topic um, the, uh, of my presentation today is really on um, stopping or preventing violence against women and girls, but um, before I delve into the, the global issue, I thought I would uh, speak a little bit about um, my interest and what brought me into the area of uh, ending violence against women and girls. So a couple of years after I graduated from Dartmouth, um, I was still undecided of what path I wanted to take in life, but I knew I wanted to work on some aspect of human rights issues. Um, I went back home to my uh, hometown of Karachi, Pakistan, and over there, 
Um, I was fortunate enough that this opportunity presented itself that a local uh, non-governmental organization, an NGO, was looking for someone to help co-lead um, their first research study on what access a survivor of sexual violence has um, when they go to seek services. Um, so that was a year-long uh, exercise that I jumped into. And I think that really helped me figure out uh, the trajectory of my career going forward. And um, what I learned during that period, I think really informs everything that we at the Trust Fund do today. As Dan mentioned, um, even in, I think, 2006, Karachi was a city of 14 million people. So if we do the math, I mean, half of them, 7 million of them are women. And the way the medical legal system works is that if uh, you, one is a survivor of sexual violence or even uh, any sort of um, accident, even an accident that can lead to potentially a criminal case, there is a specific um, path that you need to follow. So you can either go, even if you're in an accident or a victim of a gunshot wound, or as I said, a, a survivor of sexual violence, uh, your entry points are you either go to the police, who will then escort you to a medical doctor, uh, who is known as a med medical legal officer. That means that the person is trained both in the medical and legal aspects of how to collect evidence in case the, the actual you know, event ever is tried in a court of law. Um, or you go directly to a hospital. And in Karachi, uh, what we found is that there are three medical uh, hospitals where uh, a woman who is a survivor of sexual violence can access a female doctor who must be the one who examines her. And in a city of seven million women, there were eight medical officers across the three hospitals that a woman could go to, um, to be examined. And that's eight women over a course of 24 hours. So chances are that if you are a survivor of sexual assault and you go to a hospital on a Friday night, there may not be anyone there to see you. And you may be turned away or told to go to a different hospital. The legislation or the policy on the books is that there must be someone there 24 hours a day to make sure that the woman is seen, but that policy was clearly not being implemented. We also found that um, the, the medical legal centers lacked basic amenities. So if you were to, had to be examined, um, they didn't have disposable gloves, many didn't have cotton swabs, there was not, not enough lighting, no privacy to have the examination done, um, even with a curtain separating you from others that may be in the room. Uh, we also found that half of the uh, medical legal officers that we interviewed um, didn't ask for consent. It didn't occur to them that they should be asking the woman before they examine them that they can examine them. So we documented this and a lot more of the gaps and challenges that we found, and we presented um, these recommendations to um, the provincial, the Sindh um, government for uptake and recommendation. And that was the end of my one year um, stay in Karachi. I came to grad school, but it really sparked my interest in working on the issue of violence against women and sexual violence in particular. And that's something that I continued to focus on in one way or the other through grad school. And while I was in grad school, I had the good fortune um, to work at the Trust Fund to End Violence Against Women as an intern over one summer. I went back as soon as I graduated, and I have been there since in varying capacities. But the work um, is interesting and challenging and relentless, and you're learning something new every day. So um, it has just been an incredible learning experience for me from the moment I have joined. Um, so before I take a step back and talk about violence against women at the global scale, I thought I would tell you specifically about the Trust Fund a little and where I work, because I'll be coming back to some examples of projects that we fund. Um, the UN Trust Fund to End Violence Against Women was established in 1996 by the UN General Assembly. Um, and what that really means is that 
In the follow-up of the Beijing Platform for Action in 1995 um, and the Fourth World Conference of Women, where um, I believe it was the First Lady at that time, Hilary Rodden Clinton said, women's rights are human rights, and human rights are women's rights once and for all. There really was that upswell from women's uh, rights movement to say that violence against women was one critical area of concern that the world had to take notice of and address. So the trust fund, in a way, was a response by member states to come together, acknowledge that more had to be done on the issue of violence against women, and set up a fund, a mechanism that could provide technical assistance and support to developing countries around the world on this specific issue. It's an interagency fund, which means that really decision making happens across the agencies where we have varied expertise. For example, bringing together experts from UNFPA or UNICEF, which is the Children's Fund, or UNDP, the development arm, to really inform what we're doing on um, funding to civil society. And it's administered by UN Women, which is the gender arm of the UN system. So the work uh, of UN Women really now is to coordinate the work that's happening on gender issues across um, the UN system. But the Trust Fund to End Violence Against Women really predates UN Women. UN Women was established less than 10 years ago, whereas the Trust Fund has been in existence now for over 22 years. The way that the Trust Fund works primarily is that we give grants to civil society organizations. So we work like you know, Dartmouth's admissions office. We receive applications uh, from across the world uh, from organizations that are are telling us what they want to do if they receive resources from us. We vet the organizations, and then based on the number of resources we have, we give grants for that specific year. Uh, we track really what those projects, what the grants are doing. They could be focusing on any aspect of ending violence against women. And we try to learn um, from them and generate evidence across our portfolio to really inform um, programming on the issue of ending violence against women. And then we take these lessons along with the stories that we hear to advocate more globally on the issue of violence against women and to also raise resources for ourselves. And this just provides uh, you with a bit of a snapshot of how many projects we funded over the 22 years um, that we've been in existence. We funded almost 500 projects in 139 countries for approximately $140 million. Um, and the breadth or the distribution of our funding across the, across the continents is fairly even. We've given around 30% of our resources to Africa, followed by Asia Pacific, um, Latin America and the Caribbean, um, then Europe and Central Asia, and followed by the Arab states. So now you know a little bit about me, how I got to where I am, and the Trust Fund to End Violence Against Women. And we will now take a bit of a step back and talk a little bit more about violence against women and um, with some facts and figures. So we know worldwide that one in three women have experienced physical or sexual violence, mostly by an intimate partner, at some point in their lifetime. And when we account for sexual harassment, these figures are even higher. So throughout this uh, talk, I will be talking about some terms. Uh, one is IPV, which means intimate partner violence. And that is any act by a man, a woman, a girl, or a boy um, that causes physical, sexual, or psychological harm to the other person within an intimate relationship. And that's also sometimes referred to as domestic violence or family violence. And the other term that you might hear, is, so this is IPV, and the other term is NPV, which is non-partner violence. So violence, sexual, psychological, or a physical violence that's perpetrated by someone that's not an intimate partner. So um, it's estimated that 87,000 women were intentionally killed in 2017 globally. And of those, more than half were killed by intimate partners or family members. That's 137 women killed every day across the world by a member of their own family. 
And more than a third of the women that were intentionally killed in 2017 were killed by their current or former intimate partner. We also know that it's estimated that there are 650 million girls worldwide that were married as children before the age of 18. During the past decade, uh, the global rate of child marriage has gone down from one in five to one in, sorry, from one in four to one in five worldwide. But in some parts of the world, especially West and Central Africa, where this um, practice still persists, there are four out of 10 girls that were married before the age of 18. And if the current trends continue, we predict that by 2030, there will be 700 million women, young women and girls that were, are married before the age of 18. At least 200 million of the women and girls alive today have undergone female genital mutilation in the 13 countries where we have prevalence data uh, on, on this aspect. In most of these countries, the girls um, were cut before the age of five. And with global movements now, we see that this is an issue with global dimensions. We are seeing it increasingly among migrant and refugee women and girls, not just in specific parts of Africa or Asia or the Arab states, but in areas such as um, the US as well, where immigrant communities are concerned. There are approximately 15 million adolescent girls between the ages of 15 to 19 worldwide that have experienced forced sex, that is forced sexual intercourse or some other sexual acts at some point in their life. And based on data, again, from 30 countries, we know that less than 1% ever sought any sort of professional help. In a study that took place in the US itself, to show you that this is not just a problem out there, um, in 2017, um, there was a study across US campuses, I believe 27 US campuses, that found um, that 23% of female undergraduate students reported having experienced sexual assault or sexual misconduct across 27 universities. And rates of reporting to campus officials, law enforcement, or others varied from 5 to 28%, depending on the type of behavior. So even in the US, uh, in college campuses, the rates of reporting are incredibly low. The uh, numbers that I shared with you right now shows that the availability on data on the issue of ending violence against women has really increased uh, since 1995. Um, since then, there have been at least 100 countries that have conducted at least one survey on the issue, and there are at least 40 countries that have conducted two or more surveys, which allowing for comparability of data will allow us to really see uh, patterns and changes over time. In a majority of the countries where data does exist, we know that less than 40% of the women who experience violence seek help of any sort. Among women who do, most look to friends or family, and very few look to formal institutions like the police or the health sector. In fact, less than 10% of those women seeking help sought it by going to the police. There's also evidence that suggests that there are certain characteristics of women, such as the sex, uh, sexual orientation or disability status or ethnicity, or um, some contextual factors like humanitarian context or a conflict or post-conflict situations that make women more at risk of violence. For example, there was a study uh, done in six uh, low and middle income countries in Asia um, and um, Africa that found that women with a disability was two to four times more likely to experience intimate partner violence than a woman without a disability. And the level of violence by partner, by intimate partners or within the family increased with the severity of the impairment. And very interestingly, for me at least, there are a lot of studies that show that men who witnessed uh, their fathers using violence against their mothers, and men who experienced some form of violence as home as children, were significantly more likely to perpetrate intimate partner violence themselves as adults. In fact, there was one study in Lebanon that found that men who um, saw their fathers beating their women, uh, mothers were three times more likely to uh, perpetrate violence against their intimate partners in adult relationships. 
So with that, um, I come to the topic of today, prevention and why work on prevention. Now, given the devastating impact that violence has on women, understandably, most of the limited resources that we have right now have really focused on um, responses and services to providers, uh, to women, which is incredibly important to make sure that they have access to justice, there's accountability, so that their um, mental, um, social, and economic, as well as uh, psychological well-being can be met. But really, the most effective way or the best way to end violence against women and girls is to prevent it from happening in the first place. And that is by addressing its root and structural causes. There is increasing evidence, like the study on um, men perpetrating violence if they've seen it in their households, shows that there are a range of individual, community, and societal characteristics that are associated with the higher risk of violence against women. And among these, of course, there are gem gender discriminatory laws and policies, as well as social norms, behaviors, and attitudes that condone violence and that promote unequal power relations um, between men and women. But of course, the good news is these are not fixed or inherent. These are shaped by social and economic forces, and that means that over time, they can be reshaped as well. So this, along with a growing body of um, prevention practices, suggests that it is possible over time to prevent violence against women and girls. That there are steps that we can take through concerted action to tackle the underlying structures that still permit early or forced marriage or female genital mutilation or the turning of a blind eye to um, survivor of domestic violence or the impunity of rapists or um, the hostile attitudes of service providers, whether it's in police stations or in courtrooms. And addressing violence against women really involves a continuum of interdependent and mutually reinforcing interventions. And while they're conceptualized in different ways, we can think of them along the following continuum of preventing violence before it occurs, so preventing new cases of violence, preventing the recurrence of violence, that is preventing women from being re-victimized or from men from perpetrating further violence, or preventing or limiting the impact of violence against women through the provision of short and long-term care and support. I promise I'll go from theory to practice in just one more slide. So the uh, approach um, or the focus of prevention is to really address the root causes of violence against women and girls, to strengthen population level factors that protect against violence, and to address those that increase the probability of it occurring. So this involves identifying those factors as well as understanding the relationship between them. The framework adopted by UN Women and were used by many others is based on the ecological approach. And this involves considering factors along multiple levels. These are individual, relationship, community, organizational, and societal levels. And the approach is based on understanding the factors at each of the levels and how they work in a mutually reinforcing manner. So uh, for example, individual behaviors, attitudes, and beliefs are not formed in isolation, right? They're shaped by someone's immediate um, or community or organizational surroundings, as well as the larger societal structures. And at the same time, the broader structures and cultures are influenced by the attitudes and behaviors of individuals. So, for example, at the, at the social norm level, you may have the belief that women are best equipped to take care of children. How it translates into practice may be the difference in how child-rearing practices manifest in itself in the treatment of boys and girls. And at the structural level, this may manifest in pay differences between men and women. And this means that changing social norms and ultimately attitudes and behaviors will require structural as well as community, individual, relationship, and um, societal level action. So to give specific examples of how this works in practice, I thought I would share with you three examples of projects that we have funded through the UN Trust Fund. 
that are working on different aspects of prevention uh, using the ecological framework, but working or targeting specific levels within that framework. So for example, we know that uh, gender equality training programs have been shown to be effective in combating intimate partner violence and non-partner violence. And uh, these programs, when combined with things like creation of safe spaces for women, mentoring, and life skills training, are shown to really be a powerful change agents. So there is a project uh, that we funded um, for a few years by, through an organization called Pragya in India. And they were working in five rural um, communities with, uh, in five, uh, sorry, states with uh, tribal communities. And especially in these tribal communities, it's not easy to just go in and say, hey, I'm gonna do a project on ending violence against women because you are dealing with a lot of um, suspicions, uh, structural barriers, gender dynamics in terms of how things are already set up. So a lot of times organizations that are working in these communities tend to spend a long time creating some degree of uh, relationship with these, uh, with these uh, communities where they're working. So for Pragya, the entry point of the, even the conversation on ending violence against women happened through the field of nutrition um, and uh, maternal health. So they start by having dialogues on how, what it means to have uh, you know, access to a, a nutrition and adequate health for yourself, for your children, and through that start having conversations on the issue of violence against women and, and what it means. And through the project, they did a number of trainings which included gender sensitization training, not only with women themselves, but with communities, with panchayats, which are the uh, tribunals of village elders, as well as with civil society organizations to really question and address uh, the existing gender norms and structures. And what they were really successful in was getting at least around 2,800 women to come together in 100 peer groups and create their own organic system of uh, peer support networks. And women who were involved through these peer support networks reported increased levels of confidence and self-esteem and showed a high level of commitment on disseminating the information that they had learned throughout their communities. So I have a, an example here from one of the women who participated in the program. Um, this is a woman who advocates now for an end to early and forced marriage. She belongs to a tribal community in which more than 70% of the girls uh, were married before the age of 18. And the way she described her involvement in the project was that she said that women's groups are important avenues from which we can derive energy and support to carry on. And that the training I received from Pragya helped me build my skills in counseling and provide support to women and girls in my village. Sensitization is the key to reducing such cases. So what we may take as for granted as informa basic information may not be construed as such across different parts of the world in different communities. And the first step of individual attitudinal change is to make sure that we're able to share information with women so that they can be agents of their own change and participate in their own decision making. Um, coming back again to the example that I've provided on um, the data we have on uh, male perpetration and gender norms, we know that uh, children, who, when they witness uh, violence against their mothers in the family, are learning something about violence and its place in the household. So there was a project recently in Turkey, for example, that we funded from an organization called Archev that worked through a community-based approach to facilitate long-term change at the family level by engaging an innovative father support program, which was a 10-week parenting program to transform gender normative behaviors by engaging men who are fathers in anger management and responsible parenting courses to change gender behavior at the home. And through this work, the project showed that 43% of the fathers took on more responsibility in child development and household duties and applied nonviolent communication methods. 
and the measure of acceptance of men as head of households also decreased by at least 40%. So this was just one project over a three-year period that indicates that it is possible to work with men, um, even adult men, fathers, to really question um, their own uh, perception of what it means um, to have a gender uh, disparity or gender equitable households. And finally, at the community level, I'll, I'll end with this example of a project that we funded um, in Uganda with, for raising voices. And raising voices really works at the community level. So we've seen examples at the individual level, at the family level, and at the community level, what they do is um, Sasa and Swahili means now, but the methodology has been developed to have a four-stage process, which is uh, start, awareness, support, and action. And what they're really doing is, through a working at the community level, a wo uh, work with individuals in a step-by-step -step process to engage a critical mass of people to create a normative change. So from 2010 to 2012, uh, the Trust Fund supported a project to, in Eastern and Southern Africa to roll out this uh, SASA methodology. And the way the methodology works is that during the first phase, which is START, uh, violence against women, um, the, they speak about the twin pandemics of violence against women and HIV AIDS, how um, Women who have uh, are experienced violence against women uh, again, experience violence are more likely to contract HIV or AIDS, or and conversely, women who have HIV and AIDS are higher risk of violence. And what does it mean at the individual level to make that change? And once um, they start having these conversations, the next phase is awareness, where the community members. Um, experience a growing awareness about how communities accept men's uh, perpetration of violence and condone this behavior. And through the next two stages, they really work on coming together at the community level to discuss um, and accept the in, um, to discuss the unacceptability of, of violence. And this is one of the few prevention studies that has been documented and proven to be uh, effective. It, um, they work with research organizations um, and in a randomized controlled trial found uh, that this methodology was um, statistically proven to be successful amongst the cohort that utilized it. And now there are more than 60 organizations um, across the world that um, uh, working on implementing the SASA methodology across 20 countries. The trust fund right now is um, funding this project in three specific settings, in refugee camps in Kenya, in a community in Haiti, as well as in rural areas in Tanzania to see how uh, the successful approach can be adopted or adapted into varying contexts. So, I believe I had said I would leave uh, some time for um, question and answers. So I can come back. We, we have some information on projects that the Trust Fund has funded over five years on prevention. But um, maybe that will come up during our Q&A. So I will wrap up by saying that really uh, the work on prevention needs to start early in life by educating and working with young boys and girls in promoting respectful relationships and gender equality. And what that means um, is our aspects that tr translate beyond the issue of violence against women and girls. Working with youth is the best bet because for faster sustained progress, as this is a time when values and norms around gender equality are being formed. Um, this means promoting equality, gender equality, women's empowerment. It means making the homes and public spaces safer for women and girls. It means ensuring women's economic autonomy and security, as well as increasing their participation in decision making, both in homes and in public life and politics. Because ultimately, the most significant challenge to prevention is the persistence of attitudes, behaviors, and practices that perpetuate gender stereotypes, discrimination, and inequality as the root causes. And addressing this really lies at the core of prevention work. And there's a lot of work that 
is being done and continues to be done with engaging men and boys to accelerate progress, as well as using media as, and social media to create a sea change in the acceptability of violence against women and girls. So with that, I will open the floor to any questions that you have. so much for a uh, fascinating talk. So to make it maybe more concrete for us, what is there a single form of gender-based violence that is most prevalent? That is, uh, you know, from the perspective of the, uh, of the trust fund, the one that is at the top of the list that needs to be combated? There's just many, many different types that are, that are, uh, uh, that are all worrisome. I mean, they're all worrisome, but the most prevalent form of violence really is um, intimate partner violence, domestic violence, because we see different forms of violence um, manifest themselves in specific settings more often. Uh, and we can say, for example, that as I said, we see female genital mutilation um, or cutting in parts of Africa or Arab states or Asia. Um, we may see a bride kidnapping in Central Asia or honor killings in South Asia or the Arab states but domestic violence is everywhere. So that really is the most prevalent and pervasive and underreported form of violence against women and girls. So we're doing a lot of work on the issue of um, violence against women um, or intimate partner violence. And that's um, an area that remains uh, really chronically underfunded as well because it's not perhaps as, as you know, exciting or sexy as acid violence, for example. And that's something uh, where, so yeah, I would say that perhaps uh, IPV, as we said, intimate partner violence is the most prevalent form. And if I can follow up, so, um, and for combating that particular form, um, are there uh, countries or cultures that are particularly resistant to what the trust fund is trying to do. I don't want to get you into a position where you're saying something that's going to imperil the next uh, round of, uh, of grants and activity, but I'm just curious if that's something that you can discuss. So I think, um, you know, there are many countries that I think on, are at different stages within the continuum. So in some places, there is greater awareness. Um, or acknowledgement of uh, domestic violence as a human rights issue or, um, and concern. But in many parts of the world, it still is considered a family matter. You know, so I mean, maybe I can say it since I'm from Pakistan, that in a place like Pakistan, for example, it still would be, and, that, and in any other part of the world, we saw uh, from the statistics, I said, you know, for only 40% of women ever disclose it to a family member. And that's across 30 countries. Um, so it really also shows that there is a, you know, still um, this within um, the work on ending violence against women. When you, especially when you're working or talking about uh, violence within an intimate partnership, um, whether it's your, you know, your spouse, um, there are a lot of considerations that women take on what does it mean to go to the police, and they want to make sh uh, be able to see if they can resolve it uh, within. Um, you know, in one way or the other, but um, in some cultures, it's expected that women will not discuss it or disclose it, and that's where we see some of the challenges still. That um, in many cultures, it's growing, uh, it's considered unacceptable, but in some cultures, that's the way it is. And uh, dealing with those cultural norms is uh, where we need to start. Um, um, really seeing uh, where the prevention efforts take us. Because as I said, you know, it's easier to talk about child marriage or, um, or female genital mutilation or honor killing because they are specific forms of violence or in specific parts of the world. So they seem somehow, you know, that you can target them and, and, 
and work on eradicating them. But domestic violence or intimate partner violence really is the biggest area of concern. So most of your funding uh, comes from UN member nations. I mean, is there foundation funding as well, or is it entirely uh, state state funds that are uh, uh, that are provided? So at this stage, uh, we, um, the trust fund, we raise um, our own resources, but primarily through member states. So I would say around 95% of our funds, um, maybe more, come from um, mostly governments. So we, have, we receive funding from the US, from the UK, um, from Norway, Sweden, Australia. Um, and, but we also receive um, individual donations. Um, so that's, and we have received time to time donations from other funds, um, but that's not as steady. So we may see, you know, one donation from a specific individual. I think um, last year we received close to, I think, 500 or $600,000 of donations from individuals, but the rest of it tends to be from member states. And, um has your office identified a target for uh, spending that they'd like to achieve? I mean, where are you compared to where you would like to be and what you believe the uh, you know, absorptive capacity is of the countries you're working with? So I think it's not the absorptive capacity of the countries, it's the absorptive capacity of the fund that we're looking at when we think of what target we want to set. Um, Based on the demand that we've seen, um, we received around three billion in requests over the past five years. So the demand is fast. Uh, but based on resources and what we can fund and manage, we had set a target of around 20 million um, by 2020. We were far more ambitious a few years ago, but I think we've also recalibrated what it is that we as a trust fund want to fund. So um, in 2008, 2009, we were giving 20 million in grants, but what we were funding were larger organizations, were million dollar projects for governments, the UN system, uh, international NGOs. And through our own journey as a fund, I think we said that our niche or what we want to fund are women's organizations and local organizations. And their absorptive capacity tends to be lower and we're only funding three-year projects. So we are now funding projects at around three hundred to $500,000, and they're only, we can only, as a fund, manage 100 projects or so a year. So that's what is limiting us right now. If we are to receive another 50 million and grow our own administrative costs, then we would be able to fund more. But we are not the only ones that are funding this issue. Um, right now, last, year or the end of year before, the European Union um, put in 500 million euros for um, through an initi initiative called the Spotlight Initiative. And they are specifically focusing on, um, I think, 50 million euros in five countries in Latin America, uh, another 200 million in eight countries in Africa, and the rest uh, is yet to be determined across uh, Asia Pacific, um, as well as uh, I think they may be funding more countries in the Caribbean. So there are others that are working specifically on putting a lot of money in a few countries and seeing what happens when they're able to um, put, prevent, uh, put funding um, to scale. Um, we are not that fund. We're looking really at funding uh, small projects uh, through women's organizations in, in remote parts of the world and seeing what it is that these organizations um, are working on. Um, so there is a space for, for both. We are funding through the EU UN Spotlight Initiative. Um, they are funding to civil society organizations. So the way that this, and, and sorry if I'm going into too much detail, but the way this... Uh, the Spotlight Initiative is, fun, fun, is set up is they're saying we want, for example, in Latin America to work on the issue of femicide in five countries. Uh, I think Mexico, El Salvador, Honduras, Argentina, and Guatemala. And each of them, you know, I think are getting 10 to 12 million euros. Um, but they have a prescribed plan of an intervention of what they want to do and how they want to spend that money through the different UN agencies. And what we are doing as a trust fund is saying, that's great, 
but we will take a million dollars in each of those countries and fund bottom-up projects. So what it is that organizations say that they want to do, women's organizations on the ground, to address the issue of femicide. So that's how we are really complementing more the UN effort on the issue of violence against women. So I have a million more questions, but why don't we open it up to the audience first, and uh, then I'll uh, shoehorn a few in at the end. Any questions? Right there. Um, hi, uh, thank you for being here. It was uh, great listening to you today. And um, I had two questions, uh, one about funding specifically. So I was wondering, it kind, you kind of alluded to it about um, like how uh, locally situated each of the initiatives are. But I was um, wondering if you could speak more to how um, funding can possibly like complicate agency in like local level. So I was wondering like the initiatives that, you know, um, come from local organizations, how much of that is sustained throughout the process or is the need for funding like complicate that agency, if that makes sense. Um, let me see if I understood your question, and if I can't answer it, then you ask a clarifying question. Is your question about that through our funding, local organizations, are we really um, funding ground-up initiatives? Is that is that the question? Okay. So the way we work is, as I said, it's really the organizations tell us what it is that they want to do, and if we find the project compelling or sound, we fund it. So that's a little different from how sometimes organizations do function. Um, for example, when um, I was in uh, Myanmar this past summer, and we have a project from UN Women that is working on um, economic empowerment programs in, refu in IDP camps, in uh, internally displaced population camps. But we know what we want to do. We want women to get specific say handicraft and weaving training, for example, or uh, vertical farming training. So we will say we are looking for a partner that can implement vertical farming training in refugee, in IDP camps. Then you're already identifying what it is you want to do and you're just looking for someone to do it. But what it is that the trust fund does is say, we want to fund the issue of ending violence against women. You identify what is the priority in your specific community that you want to do, what strategies you want to employ, what, um, and that is what we then fund. So it may be, for example, we funded in Nepal um, an organization that was working on the Chopadi practice, which is a practice when uh, young girls or women are menstruating, they're removed from their houses into an outhouse. And there are a lot of challenges that come with that. So uh, this organization said, we want to address the issue of Chopadi, which is very specific to the context of Nepal, and uh, identified its own strategies of how they want to do it. So that's what we would fund. So our belief is that these organizations, because they know the context, uh, can identify strategies that they think will work. And there's no guarantee that every project is going to be successful, but we need to know what works and what doesn't work so that we can then inform um, broader programming. And I think uh, what we try to say is we learn as much from failure as we do from success. So we don't, we shouldn't be scared of saying, we tried that, but it didn't work. It didn't work in one specific context, but it, with a slight adaptation, it might work in a different context. Um, and every data point we get is useful. Um, I don't know if that answers your yeah. question. Okay. Actually, I have a follow-up question for that. So the the uh, the bane of um, of uh, the existence of many federal policymakers in the U.S. is the requirement from Congress that we always uh, be able to provide metrics. And I would imagine in your field it's uh, as difficult as anything that we face. So what? Uh, how do you deal with that? I mean, do you have uh, a whole array of staffers who are just uh, charged with uh, coming up with appropriate metrics for uh, for your programming? How, how do you handle this challenge? Yes, I think this is a, the bane of our existence as well, and we have a total of three staffers <laughs> who comprise our monitoring and evaluation team. So we don't have a large number of individuals, but this is something that we sort of question and grapple all the time as well. Um, what, 
how effective is it to ask every single organization for specific metrics? Um, and what is it that we really want to quantify? Um, and that, do we have to quantify everything? And what is, what is the right type of evidence? Um, and so far, what we have been ex asking our organizations is, I mean, it's so compliance heavy, right? As you're saying, we've, uh, once we give award a, a grant, we ask them to report every six months. They may get uh, audited, but they have to do a baseline, which they say, okay, this is, these are the knowledge and attitudes of the groups that we're going to be working on, and then we have to assess change over time. Um, some of it is quantitative, but we know that in the field of ending violence against women, we're also looking at qualitative change, right? What were the changes in perceptions of the women that you dealt with? And how can we take a qualitative change and develop a story around it? We're still in discussions on whether we should be expecting all our partners to be doing some sort of data uh, analysis. Is it even worth it? Or can we use case studies or human interest stories um, instead of having organizations come up with mediocre evaluations that we will never use and spend so much time and resources on that? So yes, I mean, that's something that we really are, are grappling with. Uh, what we are trying to do is encourage at least the larger organizations to work with research institutions so that they have someone else supporting them with that work. I think one of the examples I gave in one of our, my earlier talks today was, you know, we have this example of the SASA methodology that where they're now working with, I think, the University of California, San Diego, who are doing the research work with them. So they have a partner who's really going to be spending three years adapting the methodology. But we also, I went on a verification mission to one of our smaller partners and they had on their board a map of a local community, and they said, oh, you know, we went door to door, and we asked every household whether there was domestic violence in that house. And that is incredibly dangerous, right? So we need to make sure that we are not putting women at risk through data collection. There are inherent ethical and safety risks when it comes to collecting data, especially on women, um, survivors of violence, and on children. So it's something that's incredibly time consuming and cumbersome and we only want organizations that have specific knowledge or expertise to be doing it and not do more harm through our desire to collect data. Question. Hi, um, I think you've touched on this also a little bit but I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit more about how the organizations make sure that they are giving culturally relevant counseling or developing strategies that are specific to that context without imposing maybe more Western cultural ideas or norms. You know, because we can all agree violence against women is bad, but are there, is there like some things that are a little bit more murky that can be contributing to that, to those cultural norms that um, propagate violence against women that might be particular to one specific culture, but maybe not to our culture or other cultures that, see what I'm trying to say? Yeah, like of how, course. how do they make sure that the, it's very contextually relevant? So these tend to be um, local women's organizations that, and that's what we're increasingly funding. We're funding local women's organizations and through our application process, we ask them to um, really spell out the contextual factors that underlie violence against women, what others are doing in the field of violence against women within their specific context, and how their specific interventions are going to um, complement the other work that is happening. And then we also have uh, other agencies and UN Women um, present in many of these countries. So they also review the proposals that we're considering funding along with other agencies to really make a determination at the country level whether that specific intervention is appropriate. And I mean, the offside, I mean, exactly to uh, what you're saying, we can also look at the flip side where it's possible that sometimes organizations that are in that specific context may not see whether their specific uh, interventions may actually be perpetuating violence as well. So we have to be mindful that even when we're working in specific contexts, there are certain um, standards uh, of care that need to be taken into consideration. And that's where a lot of our local offices then weigh in with their technical expertise as well. We 
more posterity than Germany. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So it's basically the, the mirror of that question. Um, you want things to be culturally relevant, but then also how do you make sure that the learning from one country or one region or one program gets rolled up so that other organizations benefit from it and don't end up just reinventing the wheel? How, how, do you, how do you make sure that that information or learning is, doesn't reside just in a person but st is useful within the institution? That seems like a challenge to me. Yes, uh, and that's, it's a great question and it is a challenge for us as well. Um, we, there are a number of th ways that we try to disseminate this information, but the information, of course, only gets as far as our dissemination efforts, right? So, for example, what we are doing with evaluations that we receive from these organizations, we put them on our own website, but then UN Women has its a virtual knowledge center where it collects and disseminates uh, programming guidance and tools on what is effective and what's not. And you can search by country, by type of violence, by specific strategy. So we'd really try to influence and inform that database. Uh, UN Women also has a training center, so we try to work with the training center to ensure that at least information that's coming from our projects um, is taken up in these specific aspects. But then how far is the virtual center being used? how far are the trainings being disseminated, that's uh, harder to measure in terms of you know, how many organizations really are using that information to inform their own programming. We try to do the knowledge exchange amongst our own partners um, where we know, okay, you're implementing a project in India in the specific district. Um, there are other three other organizations over the past three years within India who did something similar, so we try to create those networks and linkages. Um, but it's really hard to determine how much of the information that we're putting out there in the virtual world is really being taken up and used. We haven't been able to really follow up on that. My question is um, how, I understand that women are affected most by violence, but also men are, not as a detractor, but as a statement of fact, but also, um, instead of framing the narrative about emancipating women from violence and gendered violence for that matter, how do you negotiate or how do you ensure that you're not creating, that we are, we are not creating a narrative of um, feminizing violence? And also, um, what is one of the projects that you've, uh, that the UNF um, Trust Fund has funded to, um, to, 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 to uh, to end gender violence that has involved men, and in what capacity have men been involved? And are there any success? Sure, yes. Like um, to answer, I think, your fir the first part of your question, I think gender-based violence is, it is gendered violence, right? So we're really, from our vantage point, or the vantage point of the trust fund, we are specifically talking about violence against women. And that does not mean that violence against men doesn't happen, but based on the data that we're looking at and the uh, trends that we're looking at, which I think I mentioned a little earlier was that we, I think we have um, half of all women that are killed intentionally or were killed intentionally in 2017 were killed by a member of their own family. Um, co that's compared to two out of 10 men for the same year. So the data also shows that this sort of violence is feminized. So we are taking that information to drive strategies on how to address it. In terms of how are we engaging men and boys, this has also been a very interesting and contentious area of work because resources are limited. And when you have limited resources, what do you focus on? Spending more money on, on, on men and boys? Um, we, some projects are. I mean, we are looking at how do we engage men and boys as change aid, agents, right? So the example on Archev was, how do you work with fathers so that we can change gender norms in the household so that the next generation uh, grows up in a, with a different construct? How do you work with uh, young boys uh, and girls um, through, a, we've had projects in Nepal and South Africa that are using soccer to teach gender equality, um, again, from a social norm change. What we as a trust fund are not funding are perpetrator rehabilitation programs. 
because the evidence on that is mixed. We don't know whether these programs work, working with perpetrators to prevent uh, recidivism. Um, and given that we have a few resources, we choose not to um, spend our money on those sort of projects. So I don't know if that I touched on all of your uh, questions, but that's really our engagement of working with men and boys. We sort of like focusing on the victim and still, I understand the importance of navigating the social gender framework in the communities, but also at some point, the social framework seems to be so intact to the point that the efforts that the NGOs and the other pro-women organization are doing end up just being cosmetic and just very, just that, there for, for, for the, visibility and then forgotten back to normal life of violence every day. And I think that's uh, precisely why uh, we have to work on prevention efforts, right? Because that really means um, upending the social structures. And that is not a one generation issue. That's a multi-generation issue. How do you really reshape uh, the whole narrative of, uh, of, of gender equality? And that includes not just, as I said, violence against women, but uh, all aspects of, uh, uh, you know, where we, we find uh, gender discriminatory attitudes, whether it's women in politics or in the care economy or in, you know, in women in the world of work. You, these sort of challenges and barriers are in every aspect of a woman's daily life. I mean, that's the current reality. And to be able to work on addressing these, th there needs to be really a systemic change across uh, all aspects of uh, gender inequality. Uh, thanks, this is great work, <laughs> great talk. Um, so you mentioned, um, first of all, you mentioned the kind of limited resources and also towards the beginning, you had the kind of three different pillars of prevention. Um, and so one of the things that strikes me is, for example, the Sasa um, initiative seems to be, and you've spoken a lot about kind of raising awareness and these kind of long-term things, but I wonder, given the limited resources, um, how you as an organization um, decide how to prioritize sort of awareness programs with more acute, like, dealing with victims with act, act, sort of active acts of violence and prevention and recurrence. I'm glad you things. asked. I have a slide for that. So let me just share with you, because I mean, I think the focus uh, of my specific talk, uh, talk was more on prevention efforts and what we're doing on prevention. But uh, really, you know, the reality is that most of the work we do is not focused solely on prevention. And we have found that you can't just, most successful projects are using more than one strategy. So the work, the way that the Trust Fund works, uh, we work in three different areas or pillars of work, right? And this coming back to my example of my experience in Pakistan, right? You have um, the issue of access to services, what happens when a woman tries to seek services. So this is working with healthcare providers, working with police to ensure that women uh, have easy access to a range of services. Then you have a work on ensuring that legislation, policies, national action plans, laws are responsive and in place. And then you have prevention efforts. And most of the prevention projects, uh, we did a meta-analysis, which is an analysis of the projects that we funded. It found that projects are more effective if they integrate it into a more holistic program. And really, the majority of the prevention projects that we fund, and this is our prevention portfolio over the past five years, the majority of the projects are not standalone prevention projects. They tend to be combined projects. And there are very few projects with no prevention components. So we are seeing that organizations aren't saying, oh, I'm only going to do prevention work. Even uh, pro projects that are working on prevention, to be strong projects should be working or at least creating avenues of engagement with other areas of work. So when you're raising awareness of the, on the issue of ending violence against women, 
and someone then discloses to you that they were a victim of sexual assault or sexual violence, you can't just say, oh, now you have awareness and, you know, I'm do I've done my job. What's the next step? What recourse does that woman have? How do you ensure that there are uh, services that are available for her to be able to go um, and seek those services? So you have to ensure that the projects that are even working on prevention create those systems in place so that once a woman does disclose that she need, she was a survivor and wants to seek access to services, those services exist in the specific communities. And that women have knowledge of the laws that they ha and the recourse they have in place if they want to take the process forward. Yes. Hi there. Um, I just wanted to ask you a quick question about how do you think your experience um, working on a project has kind of informed your later work on the project? So, I mean, I think it was really important or critical for me to see the process firsthand in the field. Otherwise, it would remain a theoretical exercise. So I think every time I talk to uh, to friends or young people who are, who are looking at you know, whether they should start their careers at the UN in headquarters or should go to the field, I said, the field can be your hometown, right? But if you, are, if you experience something yourself tangibly, I think it really provides color to your experience. And I think for me, the whole exercise would stay conceptual or theoretical if I hadn't seen and experienced it for myself. So for, I think it, it, it really was useful. Um, and even now, it's very, it's very, it's one thing to read a progress report sitting in New York, and it's completely different to go and see what's really happening with the project on the ground. And sometimes you see things seem great on paper, and then you get there, and you really see what the challenges are that may not be communicated. And on the flip side, you might have projects that really struggle to articulate what they're doing. And you may think that, oh, you know, this was, I don't think we're going to get much out of it. And then you go and you see for yourself how much work and effort is being put in by these organizations. And they're doing fabulous work, but they don't report back because they don't think it's relevant. So I think a lot of it is important to see and experience for yourself to really get a, a solid understanding of how you know, the, the issue of violence against women or any other issue, whether it's um, working in, you know, women in politics or whatever. I think that sort of grassroots experience is, is super relevant and helpful. I have a, <clears throat> a question. Um, in, in my work dealing with uh, terrorism, we started putting more and more money into countering violent extremism, which is sort of a, in some ways, a cognate field because it also relies on um, social science to figure out what works and, and what doesn't. And I'm curious, we were very frustrated in the early days because there was so little social science. Now there's been an explosion. I'm not sure we're in a better position, but at least there's been an explosion of uh, research. And I'm curious uh, if you feel like the academy is meeting um, uh, the needs of uh, the trust fund and others who are working in this area, and where do you look for uh, the best research? I think that's a, it's a great question. And I think we, at least in the area of prevention, have the same challenge because you're talking again about trying to measure something in a way that's intangible, right? I mean, how do you know you've been successful in combating extremism if you've prevented extremism? And that's really, I think, where we see ourselves with prevention efforts, right? Um, how do we really know we will be successful? Um, and uh, we're looking at... Uh, the way that we're working, the trust fund, we don't have sufficient resources, at least that we want to invest three or five million dollars in long-term projects because to really see prevention efforts pan out, I think it takes time. So we're looking at really the larger uh, international organizations that are um, excelling at prevention work. So there is an organization called Promundo that does a lot of work with men and boys um, that is funded by the UN system, but not through us. So we're looking at what they're doing and then how their uh, projects can be adapted um, through, our own, uh, through our own grants. But uh, we realize that, again, finding what really works in the field of prevention, it's an emerging or still developing field where we're still trying to collect evidence and we still have a ways to go. Okay. Any final questions? Specifically, 
and there was the whole issue of sexual trafficking, sexual human trafficking, and um, sex tourism with minors. And I was just wondering if you've been able to work on that, on a project or anything that sort of addresses that, because I sort of realized it's really prevalent. Um, Yes, I mean, we, we do fund uh, projects on trafficking. Uh, currently, we don't have a project of trafficking in Vietnam, but we're doing something similar in Serbia. Um, we have uh, not the trust fund, but uh, UN Women, um, and the UN system actually is uh, doing, uh, I think they are working in a number of Southeast Asian countries specifically on the issue of uh, trafficking. So there is a lot that's being done um, on that issue as well. And for us, as I mentioned, we are demand driven. So what we fund changes year on year. The, uh, over the past two to three years, we've been funding um, a lot more projects that are working in humanitarian settings, which was a deliberate um, area of work for us. And the other area of work that we have increased our funding on is uh, addressing violence against women and girls with disabilities, because we also found that that was a very under-resourced area of work. And we're now trying to, through targeted funding, it's not a lot, but one to two million dollars a year, trying to see whether we can generate additional evidence of um, what, what projects are doing and what's happening in that field. Okay, well, thank you so much for a fascinating talk and uh, for really enlightening us about uh, an enormous problem and some great work that is going on. So thank you so much for coming.